The evolutionary history of life on our planet is absolutely fascinating, and the fossil record reveals all sorts of amazing evidence for how different lineages of animals have evolved over time. One of the most interesting evolutionary phenomena that we see across the fossil record, and indeed even in animals today, is that of convergence, when two or more unrelated organisms end up with very similar anatomical features or body plans due to similar selection pressures acting on them. Convergent evolution is rampant across all kinds of animal groups, both living and extinct, and it makes sense that it would be. When a certain feature or bit of anatomy helps an organism to become better suited to a certain environment, behaviour or niche, it's going to make it more likely to survive and reproduce, and so pass on that feature to its offspring. Natural selection in action. So suppose an unrelated organism also happens to be living in a similar way, or adapting to a similar environment. In that case, the features that work best in that situation are again favoured by natural selection, and you might end up with a very similar looking or behaving animal. Convergent evolution. Well, people seem to really enjoy my video on the multiple times that the turtle body plan has evolved, and everyone seemed enthusiastic about me turning this into a series exploring more cases of convergent evolution. So I'll definitely be doing that. In this video, I wanted to take a look at every time things have evolved into moles, because, as it turns out, it's happened way more times than you probably realised. Again, please do leave your suggestions for more cases of convergence you'd like to see me cover, and yes, don't worry, I'll definitely be doing one on the ultimate example of convergence, crabs. Anyway, come with me as we go down the mole rabbit hole. The mole hole. The group of mammals that you most likely think of when you hear the name moles is the family called Talpidae. These burrowing mammals are members of the Eulipatifla, the larger group also including hedgehogs, shrews, solenodons, and others, all of which used to be included in the now outdated order Insectivora, before analyses using genomic data were able to better resolve mammal relationships. Talpidae itself is further divided into three subfamilies. The most basal subfamily is Europsilinae, the Asian shrew-like moles, which confusingly actually do not look all that much like moles, instead, as the name suggests, looking pretty shrew-like. They have obvious external ears, long slender tails, and small claws on their limbs that lack specific adaptations for digging. As such, they probably represent what the ancestral condition for all members of Talpidae was once like, and today only include a single genus found in southwest China and northern Myanmar. The next subfamily is Scalopinae, or the New World Moles. There are six genera included, with nine species between them. All members of this subfamily are fully adapted to burrowing, with fairly elongate tubular bodies, pointed and highly mobile snouts, reduced tails and hind limbs, reduced eyes largely obscured by their fur, as they mostly live in the dark anyway so really only need to detect light levels, no external ears which could get in the way of tunnelling and fill up with sediment, and outward turned very broad hands with enlarged claws, perfect for scraping soil. Scallopines also possess an extra structure in their hands called the falciform bone, which derives from one of the wrist bones to form what almost looks like an extra digit, though it doesn't bear a claw but makes the hand wider, increasing the surface area available for shifting dirt. The iconic star-nosed mole is also potentially included in this subfamily, although some recent work has suggested an alternate placement. Star-nosed moles possess 22 small appendages in a ring around the snout, which are brimming with thousands of tiny mechanoreceptors called imers organs, making it incredibly sensitive to touch and enabling these functionally blind mammals to navigate underground highly effectively, basically seeing by touching. Imers organs are also present in many other mole species, but the particular abundance of them on the snout of the star-nosed mole is quite remarkable. The fossil record of the scallopine moles indicates that they had quite a complex biogeographical history, with fossils being found in Eurasia and North America, and therefore making it difficult to determine where exactly they first evolved. Today, all but two scallopine species live in North America, while the Gansu mole is found in central China, and the Medog mole, only just discovered and officially named in 2021, is found in the eastern Himalayas of Tibet. The third subfamily is Talpinae which includes the Old World moles, the Shrew moles, and the Desmonds. There are two living species of Desmonds, both of which live in Eurasia, and again they don't look particularly mole-like. In fact, they're actually semi-aquatic, 
with anatomical adaptations for swimming, including elongate, flattened tails that act like rudders, long and powerful back legs with broad webbed feet, and half webbed fingers, plus nostrils and ears that have valves to stop water entering. The shrew moles within Talpinae are again different to the Asian shrew-like moles I mentioned earlier, showing once more how out of control and confusing convergent evolution can get. These shrew moles include two species that are endemic to Japan, and then also the American shrew mole. Although they superficially look somewhat like shrews, and there are some key differences with other moles, such as smaller hands that don't turn out to the sides as much, these talpine shrew moles are still very well adapted to digging, and inhabit burrows in the soil. The so-called Old World moles within Talpanae currently include 7 genera and 36 species, and live throughout Eurasia. These species are again what we think of as typical moles, and are very similar to the New World moles in their anatomy, with an array of burrowing adaptations, even including the extra enlarged bone in the hand. And they specialise in consuming small invertebrates that they come across underground, usually when they fall into their burrows and they sense the vibrations. The oldest fossil evidence that we have of Talpidae as a whole comes from the late Eocene Epoch, over 34 million years ago. The fossils have been found in southern England, and include very small pieces of jaws, teeth, and various elements from the body skeleton. The fore and hind limb bones recovered from this prehistoric mole ancestor, named Eotalpa, suggest that it was in the early stages of adapting to a fully burrowing lifestyle, with moderately developed specialisations indicating that it was somewhat suited to digging, but not to the extent that modern moles are. It's also an important fossil in ruling out the idea that talpids were at first semi-aquatic, before becoming specialised burrowers. So, talpid moles have been around for a pretty long time, and they're a relatively diverse and widespread group of mammals. It's clear then that the mole lifestyle and body plan must be a successful one, and it's therefore no surprise that it's been converged upon quite a few times by unrelated animals. Let's take a look at some of these mole mimics then. Firstly, the golden moles. Golden moles, technically members of the family Chrysochloridae, are an entirely African lineage, being particularly diverse in South Africa. 21 living species are known across 10 genera, and they look incredibly similar to talpid moles. However, they belong to a completely different branch of the mammal family tree, as shown by molecular studies of mammal relationships. While talpids are included within Laurasia theria, alongside bats, carnivorans, pangolins, and hoofed mammals, Golden moles are members of Afrotheria, the major group including many mammals that live or originated on the African continent, such as elephants, aardvarks, sea cows, tenrecs, and others. So this large African mammal group independently evolved their own version of moles, which is pretty amazing. Golden moles are very compact and tubular in overall shape, with small limbs and no visible tail or eyes. The eyes are in fact entirely covered by skin, making them completely vestigial. They have very dense, moisture-resistant fur, and no external ears, just very small openings covered by the hair. Instead of having quite pointed snouts like talpids, golden moles possess a wide leathery pad over the nostrils, which is used in excavating soils and sand. These moles use their heads to push sediment in front of them, and their forelimbs bear a massive claw on the third digit that's used like a pick while the other digits are reduced in comparison. The hind feet have webbing between the toes, used in pushing loose sediment back down the tunnel while they burrow. In regions where the desert sand is too loose to construct tunnels, golden moles will actually swim through the sand, utilising the enlarged forelimb claws. Some species of golden moles are also known to possess highly enlarged middle ear bones, which are suggested to enable these little mammals to be sensitive to very low frequencies, and therefore to aid in prey capture, and in avoiding being preyed on themselves. They also have particularly tightly coiled cochlea, again suggesting a reliance on low frequency sounds to navigate and feed. The oldest fossils of golden moles so far found date to the Middle Eocene, around 47 million years ago, and come from a site in Namibia. It's interesting that Afrotherian moles might therefore have originated at a similar sort of time to Laurasiatherian moles, at least based on what we know from the admittedly very poor fossil record we have of them, both appearing during the Eocene Epoch. It's also interesting that so far the oldest golden mole fossils are older than the talpit mole ones, meaning that, like in the case of the turtles too, the so-called true moles might in fact be the mole mimics themselves. Convergent evolution really is wild. 
Anyway, these oldest golden mole fossils belong to a species named Diamantochloris inconcessus, described in 2015. It's known from a few jaw fragments and teeth which display many of the characteristic golden mole features, and also shows some similarities to the anatomy of Tenrex, another group of Afrotheres, providing some direct fossil evidence for the close association between these African mammals. But it's not just the golden moles that have converged on the mole body plan. There's also a remarkable lineage of marsupials that have become incredibly mole-like too, the unsurprisingly named marsupial moles. These mammals, members of the family Notorectidae, today comprise just two species that both inhabit Australia. Marsupials are one of the major living subgroups of mammals, the others being the monotremes and the placentals, and famously include pouched species such as kangaroos, koalas, wombats, and a wide array of other amazing mammals. So the marsupial mole is pretty distantly related to the talpid and to the golden moles, both of which are placentals. And yet, convergent evolution led to Australia's own version of the mole. Again, these are tubular animals with dense fur, non-functional eyes beneath a layer of skin, no external ears, just small openings, short tails, and flat hands and feet bearing enlarged claws. In these marsupials, it's the third and fourth digits of the hands that have the large claws, while the feet have reduced digits and bear three small claws each. They are similar to the golden moles in that they possess a fairly blunt snout, and they've extended the naked patch of skin over the nostrils further back along the head into a toughened shield-like structure. Since they are also marsupials, it means they possess pouches where their developing offspring spend the first part of their lives being carried around. Of course, having a pouch when you're a burrowing organism making tunnels through sediment is a bit of a hindrance, as the pouch is probably going to end up being filled by that sediment. The marsupial moles have a solution for this though, as they've evolved pouches that open backwards, stopping sand from getting in as easily as they move forward. Marsupial moles are also unusual compared to the placental moles in that they aren't known to create permanent burrows to live in, instead letting the tunnels they dig collapse behind them. They also differ in possessing fused neck vertebrae, making the head and neck region very strong and rigid, helping the animals as they force their way head first through the soil. The fossil record of marsupial moles so far comprises just one species, named in 2010 as Narrabarictes filcreseri. The fossil material for this marsupial dates back to the early Miocene epoch, just over 20 million years ago, and it's been described as genuinely transitional, in that it displays an intermediate stage in becoming more specialised and more like the anatomy of modern marsupial moles. Narrabarectes is also very interesting in that its paleoenvironment was a closed forest, showing that marsupial moles began to evolve their digging specialisations in the context of this sort of habitat. Previously, some had suggested that marsupial moles had always inhabited desert environments, and that their specialised anatomies had evolved in these habitats, but this fossil evidence shows that they really evolved in wet forested areas, and were then pre-adapted for moving through drier soils when the climate of Australia later became much more arid. So there are three lineages of living mammals that have all converged on the mole body plan, some pretty remarkable cases of evolutionary convergence. But mammals have been around for a long time, and the fossil record indicates that some extinct lineages also got very mole-like. Modern-day pangolins are an incredible group of mammals, and are also very sadly threatened by intensive poaching. These mammals are members of the order Folidota, and you probably wouldn't expect it, but they have some prehistoric relatives that again looked just like moles. The extinct Pelianodonta are Folidotomorphs, or stem group pangolins meaning they're very closely related to them, but are not technically pangolins. Paleoanodonts lived from the mid-Paleocene epoch, around 62 million years ago, and survived until just over 30 million years ago. One branch of these pangolin relatives gave rise to a lineage known as Epoikotheriidae, which is actually a so-called paraphyletic or unnatural grouping that needs redefining, but for now we'll keep calling them this to make things simpler. Within the Epoikotheriids, at least three very late surviving species from the Oligocene Epoch all display some incredible adaptations for digging. Xenocranium, Epoikotherium, and Molitherium from North America and Europe have many features of their skeletons suggesting a subterranean lifestyle and a close convergence on moles. These include bones of the forearms that look incredibly similar to those of the golden moles, suggesting they probably dug in a similar fashion, 
Various muscle attachment points of the forelimbs that indicate a strong digging capability, fused neck vertebrae like marsupial moles, reduced eyes, and enlarged middle ear bones. In Xenocranium, the snout was upturned and spatulate too, the ideal shape for shoveling through sediment. This means that over 30 million years ago in the Oligocene, there was yet another unrelated lineage of mammals, this time stem pangolins, that once again convergently evolved a very mole-like anatomy and way of living. So those are the best examples of mammals independently evolving the mole body plan, with all these different lineages converging to quite an extreme degree. However, there are also a lot of other cases where animals have become specialised for digging and also converged on many mole features, but not necessarily to quite the same extent. So let's briefly go through them, even further down the mole hole. Burrowing behaviour and associated specialisations have cropped up a few times among various lineages of rodents, the most diverse order of modern mammals. Considering how widespread and adaptable these animals are then, it's perhaps not surprising that some of them have also become somewhat mole-like. Within the superfamily of rodents that includes mice, rats, hamsters, lemmings, and others, there's a particular family called Spalacidae. Within this family, there are three groups that all have burrowing adaptations. First, there's the subfamily Spalacinae, or the blind mole rats. These rodents today inhabit Eurasia and comprise around 11 species in two genera. This group is probably the one with the most specialisations for life underground of any rodents, with reduced eyes completely covered by skin, no external ears, and no obvious tail. Interestingly, they possess lines of stiff and potentially extremely touch-sensitive hairs along each side of the head, likely aiding in navigation. They also have incredibly long front incisors on the upper and lower jaws that are so extended that they always protrude from the mouth, and are used to help dig underground. The oldest blind mole rat fossils date to around 24 million years ago and have been found at a site in Eastern Europe. Members of the genus Tachyorectes, sometimes called the African mole rats or root rats, are also included within Spalacidae, and the genus comprises 13 named species, including one, the King African mole rat, named Tachyorectes rex, meaning that there is actually a kind of mole rat called T. rex, and I just love that so much. Root rats are herbivorous and have varying degrees of subterranean lifestyles, with the big-headed African mole rat spending a lot of time on the surface, whereas most others feed and live underground the majority of the time. These rodents still have functioning eyes, and also use their chisel-like incisors to dig through soil. The larger grouping of rodents that root rats belong to are known from fossils again dating to around 24 million years ago, and show that these rodents used to be much more diverse in the past and underwent multiple periods of dispersal from Asia into Africa. Also within the Spalacidae family, there are the Zocors, the subfamily Myospelacinae. These burrowing rodents inhabit parts of Asia and include two living genera with six species. They spend most of their time underground, but unlike the other burrowing rodents, primarily use their enlarged claws to dig, instead of mostly relying on their incisors, a closer convergence on moles again. They also have reduced eyes and lack external ears. The expanded leathery patch of skin above the nostrils is also quite reminiscent of golden and marsupial moles. Another major family of burrowing rodents unrelated to all the groups we just looked at is Bathyergidae, also called the Blesmoles. Just to confuse things even more, Blesmoles are also sometimes called African mole rats, but they're a completely different lineage to the African mole rats of the Tachyorectes genus that we just looked at. Don't go into rodent taxonomy, you will regret it. There are about 21 living species across five genera, and they are found today in southern Africa. Blesmoles again display many of the classic burrowing adaptations we've seen many times before, including tubular bodies with dense fur, reduced eyes, very small external ears, and reduced tails. Blesmoles mostly use their incisors to dig, and also possess hind feet covered in very stiff hairs, to help move more soil. A close relative of the Blesmoles, but placed in its own family, is the iconic Naked Mole Rat. Based on molecular evidence, the Naked Mole Rat seems to have diverged from the Blesmoles sometime around 31 million years ago, indicating that these rodents evolved in parallel for a long time, and also explaining the differences between them. Once again, they have many digging adaptations, such as reduced eyes and external ears, and they also utilise their incisors to process soil. 
However, unlike the Blesmoles, there's been a significant loss of fur in the species, except for a few very touch-sensitive whisker-like hairs spread across the body. Naked mole rats are truly fascinating animals, since they're one of the only used social mammals, meaning they have a social structure similar to that of bees and ants, they're also the only known mammal to be poikilothermic, meaning their body temperature varies widely and typically follows the environmental temperature, and they're notably resistant to cancer, plus they live relatively long lives for a rodent. Moving over to another major rodent group, it turns out that South America also has its own sort of mole-like burrowing rodents. These are the tucotucos, the name given to the around 60 different species within the genus Tenomis. They don't quite have such extreme subterranean adaptations as some other more mole-like rodents, but they still have small eyes and external ears, prominent incisors, and long claws on the forelimbs for digging. Tucotucos are members of the caviomorphs, meaning they're relatives of capybaras, agoutis, pacaranas, and others. So rodents have yet again converged on this sort of body plan as they became adapted for life underground. Moving away now from the extensive and complicated domain of the rodents, there's another unrelated mammal lineage that has also turned out a pretty mole-like member, the armadillos. Specifically the fairy armadillos, the members of the subfamily Clamiforinae. There are two species alive today that both inhabit South America, the greater fairy armadillo and the pink fairy armadillo, and they also have many adaptations for digging. These include reduced eyes and ears, massive claws for scraping at the soil on their enlarged hands, and a generally tubular shape. Armour is present along the back but doesn't extend as far as in some other armadillo species, and is relatively soft. In the pink fairy armadillo, this carapace is only attached to the body via a thin membrane that runs down the spine, whereas in the greater fairy armadillo, it's fully attached, like in other armadillo species. They also both have well-developed head shields that presumably help with shifting dirt underground. Surprisingly little is known about these elusive mammals due to how difficult it is to study them in the wild, but they're undoubtedly fascinating. Molecular evidence suggests that the fairy armadillo lineage probably diverged from others about 32 million years ago, which could indicate that the changing climate of South America during the Oligocene, making it more arid, drove the evolution of subterranean lifestyles in these mammals as new ecosystems developed. The greater and pink fairy armadillos themselves diverged from one another around 17 million years ago, which also happens to be around the time of a major marine incursion onto the South American continent. Since today the greater fairy occurs in regions to the north of a major river basin, and the pink fairy has a separate range to the south of the basin, it's possible that this marine incursion actually resulted in the splitting of their ancestral population into these two distinct lineages when they became cut off from one another by higher water levels. So mammals have turned into mole-like creatures on numerous occasions, and I'm sure there were probably more times in the past that very mole-like mammals evolved too. But considering how generally small and delicate bones of such burrowing animals are, and therefore how unlikely they are to become fossilised, it seems unlikely that we'll ever be able to find all of the times that things evolved into moles. But it's not just mammals that have become mole-like. There are also some very different kinds of animals that have converged, at least a little, on features of the body plan. One of these, it could be argued, is the Mexican mole lizard. We've actually done a whole Animal of the Week episode on this reptile a while ago if you'd like to learn more about it, but basically it's a type of reptile called an Amphisbanian. Amphisbanians are usually completely limbless, but they're different to snakes. However, the Mexican mole lizard and its relatives, all members of the genus Bipes, retain forelimbs. The head is very blunt, with a short rounded snout useful for pushing through sediment, and the forelimbs bear claws that are used to scrape away at soil. Another non-mammalian instance of some convergences on moles is the so-called mole cricket, which, as it happens, we've also done an Animal of the Week episode on, if you'd like to find out more. These are insects in the family Grylotalpidae, relatives of locusts and crickets, that have tubular bodies and flattened shovel-like forelegs adapted for digging. These forelegs even have claw-like projections called dactyls. They're also covered in a coat of small hairy bristles, called setae. The top part of the thorax also has an expanded and shield-like pronotum, which presumably helps them move through soil more easily. They burrow underground to depths of between 6 to 8 inches, and they spend the majority of their life cycle beneath the surface. 
there are about 65 different species in this family, and it's pretty incredible that even on an entirely unrelated branch of the evolutionary tree of animals, this insect has some of the features of mammalian moles, showing the power of convergent evolution when two very different animals have a similar lifestyle. And finally, we come to another astonishing instance of convergence on moles, the so-called mole crabs. These are members of the crustacean superfamily Hippoidea, which contains three families and has a fossil record reaching back to the Cretaceous period. These crabs are pretty diverse in anatomy and behaviours, but many are specialised for digging down into sandy sediments using their thoracic legs, which are also fairly flattened and shovel-like. Incredibly, despite the name, mole crabs are neither moles nor crabs, as they all belong to Anomura, the group also including hermit crabs, which are not true crabs at all, they're actually the sister group to them. So mole crabs are a kind of double convergence on both moles and crabs, which is just kind of incredible. And in case you hadn't been mind blown enough yet, there's a family of true crabs called Raninidae that also look pretty similar to the mole crabs. Another instance of unrelated evolutionary convergence as these crabs also bury themselves in the sand. So there we have it, every time that things have evolved into moles, or at least evolved some mole-like features. Researching for this video has been a very rewarding experience, I actually had no idea how deep the mole hole was going to go, and wow it's just convergence after convergence. It's also shown me that the crab convergence video is going to be quite the experience. I've only had a taste of the complexities of crab evolution right at the end there, and it's already blown my mind several times. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I've loved making it, and again please do let me know your suggestions for more cases of convergence to cover. Anyway, thank you for watching, and a big thank you to our Patreon supporters, especially our Dinosaur Tier supporters, Amanda Von Nordek, Archianthus, Clara Middleton, Daniel Ingraham, Dhruv Srivastava, Gary Arrington, Giotist, Greg Silvernail, Corey Peterson, Loxipu, Mark Nevin, Mendicant Friar, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Persian Boy, Ralph Balzac, Robert Thomas, and Steve Bradshaw. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.